Laura Dresser is a labor economist and expert on low wage work and workforce development systems. For more than two decades, she has led the work on the state of working Wisconsin, which documents work and inequality in the state. She has also written about low wage jobs, care work, inequality, and labor market reform. Laura is a clinical associate professor here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. Laura. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, I'm really uh, uh, pleased and honored to be here. I will not take my whole 15 minutes because I know um, hearing from workers is actually the thing that we have come for. I just wanna provide a little bit of a frame uh, and some of the context from the Wisconsin, what I'm seeing in the Wisconsin economy, what we've documented for a long time. Um, as many of you know, this has been a record, record-breaking year in Wisconsin. We have had most of the last 12 months under 3% unemployment uh, level of sustained low unemployment, often predicted by economists to be um, impossible. And uh, we actually hit 2.4% unemployment two times this last year in April and May. Um, so uh, very low unemployment. We just hit a record number of jobs in the state, over 3 million jobs. Um, we're recovered to before where we were in 2019. Um, labor force, force participation rates are um, back to where they were in 2019. There was a after, you know, with this sort of recovery from the deep contraction uh, that was the result of the pandemic shutdowns in 2020. Um, and and I think for me, when I think about what I'm seeing in this economy is if we have had a long and what we've documented in the state of working in Wisconsin for <laughs> decades now, I show my age, um, what we've documented is a long tipping of uh, the balance of power away from workers and towards uh, corporations. And I would say what we've seen in the last three years is a slight correction. This doesn't mean that everything is better or that it is easy to be a worker in any sort of job, but it does mean that workers see their power. The low unemployment rate allows them to see their power and to see their options. And you can see workers seizing options by changing jobs and by staying in jobs and working to improve them with the people they work with. And that, so that kind of upsurge in support for unionization, upsurge in solidarity at the worksite level, is is um, is is a result directly of what workers are doing and the ways they are seeing opportunity in this economy and the way that shows up in this data. I think that's most striking and most positive to me is that um, for a long time, when we have had wage growth, when we have had economic growth over the last decades. Um, it's it's really rewarded the people who are already on top. And the growth over the last, since the pandemic, the wage growth has been disproportionately at the bottom of the labor market. It is the lower wage workers who have actually moved wages faster than inflation at the median workers' wages fell last year because even the wages were up, inflation was up by more. So workers ended up behind. But low wage workers moved faster than inflation. And since 2019, black workers, Hispanic workers, the Hispanic Latino workers, uh, both men and women have wage increases above the rate of inflation, substantial wage increases. White wages are just staying with inflation. And so gaps are closing because low wage workers are the ones that are taking the most advantage of this situation and have changed the jobs the most. And that um, I think is especially important to see. And what we're trying to honor here is that we can see in the data the way that workers are changing jobs. And we know they're doing that and, you know, sort of by themselves, by moving or individual ways, demanding more, but we're also seeing more and more collective work. And the workers here are part of that collective work and represent um, some of the best things that are happening in the Wisconsin economy right now. And so that's, um, you know, kind of my working Wisconsin uh, overview. I encourage you to dig into the report at any point, but I want to hand it over to uh, Adrian to start off the questions. 
uh, so that we can hear directly from workers. Thanks so much for that, Laura. That was great. Um, a wonderful way to situate us as we begin. So now I'm going to take a moment to introduce all of you to our wonderful panel of worker leaders. We are really excited to have workers both from the service sector as well as the construction industry with us today. So uh, first I'd like to introduce Thomas Wynn, a security guard, and Troy Brewer, a cook from Pfizer Forum in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Both are stewards um, with their union MASH. We have Kayla hum Kaylee Humphrey from the Paps Theater Group. She is an event staff lead. She's also the chief steward at her unit. Kaylee, because um, she uh, works to live and um, doesn't live to work, um, is actually going to need to um, bow out um, earlier, as well as um, some of our the other workers that I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. They are uh, Jason Palacios and Marlon Palacios, both who are um, insulators here in uh, the Madison, uh, Dane County area. Um, they too will have to return uh, to the workplace. And finally, I'd like to welcome Jack Savin and Abigail Marcus, both of whom are baristas at the Starbucks on State Street here um, just off of uh, UW Madison campus. So um, welcome everyone. We're so glad to have you with us. So we'll just get uh, started straight away. And this is actually a rather large question that I would love to hear um, from all of you um, on. Uh, from your perspective as a worker or as workers, um, what is your assessment of the economy and your job security over this past year? Um, you can contrast that with what Laura just shared about what she's seeing in the data, but we'd really like to hear from you do you feel that you are doing better this year than you were the previous year? Or do you feel uh, like you're falling behind? So uh, we'll go ahead and take uh, Thomas and Troy uh, first, if you guys would like to weigh in on that question. Uh, in terms of job security, I would say it's definitely gone up over there at Pfizer Forum, at least in the security department. Uh, I would also say we're certainly on track to do better than we were doing last year due to the fact that we just got wages raised across the board for everybody. Uh, again, I can't really, I don't know if you want to talk about how things have been leafy. But... Well, unfortunately, we don't have our contract yet, but uh, we're working on it as a couple of TAs, just some T's to be good, cross and I's to get dotted, and we're pretty close, like maybe a week, week and a half out. So I'm excited about that. We work really hard over at the Pfizer Forum and me being a cheap steward over there, it's it's been grueling. Uh, we had an off season that was, I don't know, I guess the best way to put it is like, I didn't think management and had higher ups just felt Felt so lowly of the, the the average everyday worker. So we're doing that. The wages going up is is great, but with the economy and inflation, I mean, mortgage and rent. Just for instance, like a eight hundred and fifty dollar apartment is now thirteen fifty. So it's like, yeah, we got the raises, but it's going to go towards that, and it's really not enough for the things that we do. Really powerful. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Troy and Thomas. So what I'm hearing is, yes, you're seeing extra money in your paycheck coming in uh, every other week, but it's go just as quickly as it comes in, it goes right out. Kaylee, what is your experience? What How are you feeling about where you are um, this year compared to last year in terms of your job and, and how the economy is treating you? I would definitely have to agree with Troy and Thomas on that. Um, I, at my company, we are just coming up on a year of our um, contract date. So we've been ratified for a year in November. And since then, we've seen wages go up and we've seen um, objective criteria for promotions, stuff like that. Um, but at the same time, rent, gas, expenses across the board go up at the same, at the same level. So it, it is definitely tough. But in terms of job security, I'm feeling a lot better about my job since we um, have unionized. So at least there's one thing uh, to be reassured about there. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Yason and Marlon, um, 
how about you? How are you all feeling about uh, your place in the economy and, and how, how you're doing as workers? Eh, bueno, de, de, de la parte eh, de economía, porque la economía de acá nos ha, nos ha tratado bien, pues no hemos tenido ningún problema. Eh, bueno, en la parte de la construcción, eh, como nosotros no trabajamos en una empresa específica, sino que nosotros le trabajamos a, a, a un contratista. Entonces, nosotros, este, la, eh, la economía, este, se ha visto que la economía se ha mantenido, pues no ha tenido mucho cambio eh, desde el año pasado. Este año se ha mantenido y se, y se espera pues, que se mantenga el resto del año. Eh, bueno, en conforme a los salarios, eh, los salarios eh, se han mantenido, aunque la, el, la como diera yo, el, lo, lo que nosotros, el costo de vida ha aumentado, ha aumentado lo que son las canastas básicas, el, la renta eh, y el salario se ha mantenido, entonces una parte de eso nosotros estamos peleando a ver si podemos tener un, un aumento pues, en la parte de lo que es la construcción. Eh, so, um, in essence, they've noticed that the economy has been in their in their industry as insulators. It's been relatively stable. Um, wages haven't necessarily increased for them at all. They don't necessarily work for a specific company because they more so work for um, independent contractors, subcontractors that then um, provide them the jobs. Um, where they don't really have as much opportunity for an agreement or a contract with those subcontractors. Um, so on that end, their wages haven't been increased rel relatively in the last year, um, but cost of living has been going up where um, wage increases is something that they're especially concerned about. Um, bueno, pues también, pero nosotros hemos hablado con nuestro jefe pues y él sí nos ha hecho un aumento pero bueno pues nos hemos fijado que otras compañías otras empresas no no hay aumento para hay un salario bajo y como decía pues eso que todo va subiendo pues los costos de la canasta básica ¿no? la canasta básica y la forma de vida pues va subiendo cada día más ¿no? y el salario a un aumento. Bueno, puede ser. El proceso también es lo que. El de acuerdo que tienen con las mayordomas, eso es algo donde nada más van a ir para que se los aumente si también los señores se cansan. Sí, son los que van a ir. So, Marlon says that very similarly, the cost of living goes up. And um, in terms of if they're seeing that their wages do need to be increased. It's relatively very informal. They can go to their subcontractor and then in, in that sense, it very much is that becomes their agreement. Um, so with the, their current subcontractor, um, it has been increased to fit the cost of living over time, but there is still, um, there's an issue there with just the cost of living keeps rising. Um, and in generally, that is very much their specific situation because there are other workers that are in the exact same position as them that because of their relationship with their employer, in this case, the, the subcontractor, um, and from their small company, they don't, they don't get their wages increased. They don't have that relationship with them to just be able to have conversation with them and see if that can raise their wages. Um, so in general, that is a very, their, their specific situation with their subcontractor in that relationship. Thank you very much. Uh, Jack and Abby, how are you both feeling about your position in the economy and how well you've fared uh, this past year compared to last? I feel like with Starbucks, it definitely, the wages have been reflected against inflation, but definitely nowhere near a good amount to feel stable within my own like income level. So I gotta say, I agree with everyone here where we're paying the bills, but it's definitely not coming in as fast. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Abby because she actually is leaving Starbucks for a reason. And I'll let her explain why. 
Yeah. So with Starbucks, it's like everyone has said, you know, they increase things as they feel needed um, with the state and cost of living and whatnot. But I personally, like I'm reaching my three year mark in four days and I make 75 cents more than someone who starts today. So it's really not it's really not great. Um, and they, you know, they have, uh, our minimums you have to reach, uh, each week to get benefits, to stay employed. They make those hour minimums a thing, and then they don't give you those hours. They've cut our, um, our staff at our store basically in half. We had about 50 people working at our store last year at this time. Now we have maybe 30. Um, so they change things as there's pressure to change things, but there's still no contract and no security in that. If you can't fit what they are asking you to fit, and then on top of that, if they don't schedule you to fit what they want, they will get rid of you, and there's no real security in that. I want to um, talk to you all or hear from everyone and start with Kaylee because I know her time with you is especially precious. Um, uh, just to hear about each one of you has done organizing to try and improve jobs um, over the, the past year. And I think it's really important just for people to get to hear from you about what um, what does organizing you are you're all in very different settings but what does organizing look like what are you doing um in the work of organizing and how how has that been going in the last year and kaylee i'd love to start with you on that and this is one for everyone too and so um you can raise your hand when kaylee's done or i'll i'll pass it around uh so organizing for me it was i think it was extra special because i've worked at my company for four years just last week and all of the people I work with are very good friends of mine, and we've grown together in organizing. Um, we got taken down halfway through by COVID, obviously, so the organizing efforts had to restart coming back from that. But within a year, we were able to keep everything under wraps and really grow back to nearly 100%, and our vote went through with one no vote. <clears throat> Um, and it was really, really gratifying to see that all happen. It was definitely difficult because of the nature of our company. We have six different venues um, and we're across three different departments that work in different parts of each venue. So get, getting a hold of everybody, you know, scheduling meetings where everybody's available. It was difficult and it was a long process, um, but it was my one of my favorite things I've ever done it was a really really good time um I was very impressed with us being able to keep everything under wraps it never leaked to management and we got through but yeah yeah it was a good time for me <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome and you all have moved through can you just because other people may not know this story perfectly can you talk about like when when you got your um your vote and then that you've moved through to contract and all that like how that how that organizing yeah. went across through to that? We went public. I don't know exact dates, but it was, I believe, March of 22. And we had our vote, I think it was April 1st. Um, so that whole summer we spent bargaining and we had, we have three different departments. We have hospitality, event staff, and box office. And we had a few representatives from each department at the bargaining table all summer, one day, four hours a week. Um, um, up until November when we had a final, a finished contract and we got it signed. And like I said, now we're coming up on a year and it's definitely still a work in progress every day, um, upholding the contract and continuing to organize newcomers and everything. But um, getting past that, that finish line and having your first contract is one of the best feelings in the world, honestly. Great to hear. Congrats on that. Uh, with that, I will head out of here. I appreciate you both having me. Um, and I'll definitely be looking into this later and watching what everybody else says. Thank you Thank all. Thank you so much, Kaylee. Somebody else want to talk about organizing across the last year and uh, what organizing means in your work site and how it uh, you're kind of building solidarity, building power. 
what's what's going on. I know it looks different in each site. Somebody want to step in or should I call on uh, Abby? At our store, our Starbucks on State Street, um, like Haley was saying, oh, all of us that work there are really close to each other, really good friends. And so we had a union before we had a union, you know, um, we really like that store is so close, so tight knit. We all really care for each other and it shows in our day to day. Um, it just did not reflect from the company to our side. Um, so for us, organizing was, I would say a fairly like easy process compared to what a lot of the other Starbucks stores had dealt with. Um, we also won our vote, I think it was 18 to two, or it was 20 to two, something like that. Um, and I, I want to say we started the whole process in March, went public in April. Jack can correct me on that if I have the dates wrong. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a contract yet. Not a single Starbucks store does. So it's still going to be a long road for us as far as that goes but our store culture um with our workers has just gotten worlds better um from starbucks and it's not been great um they are really notorious and awful with union busting and just heavy corporate presence in our store things like that but the people itself like the i i would very easily say that the two people who voted no have either left the store by their own choice and gone to something else or have probably turned around and you know seen that this really has unified us all really well um so it, it's been a great process for us i got to um have the opportunity to go on the starbucks workers united bus too as well which went all over the country. Um, and that was a really, really, really incredible experience. And I'm so grateful that something, you know, that started just with us at our own store led me to be able to go speak and talk with people from everywhere else about all of this stuff. It's been really a great, great experience. That's great to hear. And especially um, interesting to hear, of course, because you don't have the great story that Kaylee has where you get to negotiate a contract you get you know you have your vote but now you're just waiting on this so jack do you want to weigh in a little bit on what it's um what that's what organizing looks like now after your vote but while you know you're waiting on a corporation that's pretty committed to waiting you out yeah i think starbucks has its very union busty moments um which obviously sucks but when we organize and when we first started organizing a lot of it was about communication with each, with each other and keeping each other on the same kind of mindset um where it's not like we hate starbucks it's like we hate what starbucks is doing to their workers we want a contract fix that it's to fix just everyone that works at a store there's i think there's nine thousand stores in the u.s and i think just under 400 of them are unionized. So it's like these 400 stores are trying to bargain and be sad at the table with Starbucks and they keep avoiding that. And I think that that helps push the drive between all stores and all organizers, like people on my committee and say the capital store, which is just down the street from us. Um, Starbucks like being so union busty. What I'm trying to say is Starbucks being so union busty is just kind of more of a drive for us to pursue what we want to pursue for us as workers for this company. We've heard a little bit about what organizing looks like um, in, uh, a, within a formal structure, like whether that means um, going through the NLRB, the National uh, Labor Relations Board, filing for an election, winning and actually bargaining a contract. But I'd really like to hear too from Jason and Marlon about what organizing looks like in what one might call an informal um, and an informal pathway, which means uh, that may not involve uh, formally filing 
uh, to be led by a union um, or to create their own union, that workers um, create their own union, but that they still can band together. And I would really love to hear from you both about what that looks like to you in your workplace and what you all have been doing um, to organize. Bueno, este, eh, nosotros eh, teníamos un, tuvimos un problema con, con una empresa eh, que se llama FDM. Eh, a raíz de esa empresa nosotros tuvimos un problema con un, con un salario, pues que un robo de salario. Eh, entonces nosotros eso nos forzó este, a, a unirnos, buscarnos unos con unos otros. Eh, y entonces... Eh, nosotros este, nos reunimos este, para, para poner en la situación y, y entonces ahí fue donde nosotros ya decidimos unirnos para un solo objetivo que era recuperar ese dinero. Eh, a raíz de eso nosotros hemos, este, estuvimos en reuniones siempre unidos porque nosotros dijimos si este, solo uno hace el trabajo eh, no se puede este, hacer, una sola persona no puede hacer todo el trabajo. Y entonces miraron que nosotros estamos unidos y donde estamos organizados, que todos estamos unidos por un solo objetivo. Eh, hubo una respuesta positiva de parte de, de, la, de, la, de la compañía que había contratado a esa empresa para, para el trabajo. Y entonces a raíz de eso nosotros no. Este, este, lo organizamos y pues por la misma organización eh, nosotros logramos un, un, el objetivo que era recuperar nuestro dinero. Okay. Um, sí. So, for them, their organizing efforts started after they had a problem with um, the construction company that hired their subcontractor, FDM Construction. Um, FDM Construction was the problem, was the company that they had the problem with. Um, so FDM had stolen their wages from them. Um, they hadn't received their wages for a long period of time, and that was what forced them to unite more than anything. Um, other than that, they would mostly just do their work independently um, as it was asked from them. So they ended up having to have several meetings with one another to recover their wages, figure out how that was going to come about. And throughout those several meetings, they decided to do it as a group because one person can't be responsible to recover those wages um, solely. It wasn't going to be as evocative. It was going to be as powerful. Um, so they decided to go straight to the company that had hired FDM. So in construction, um, it's just a chain of subcontracting. Um, so for the most part, um, a lot of companies decide to, to say that the real person responsible for your wages is the one that directly hired your subcontractor or the company that your subcontractor is working for. Um, so they decided to just circumvent that entirely and go straight to the company, which was Stevens, and that was how they recovered their wages. Um, they decided to keep going to their offices until they just had to give them their wages, and that was how they ended up recovering it. Um, but more than anything, it was an organizing effort by force um, through the stolen wages and then decided to do it as a group. Awesome. Really powerful story. Um, I'll... Uh... I'm sure that we'll follow up on that actually a little bit later, um, but I do want to go back to uh, Thomas and Troy um, as, and I mean this in the best way, as the old timers, meaning the folks um, with the uh, with a, a union um, in your union um, that has a little bit of, uh, you know, a tooth, a little bit of an established presence. Um, we've heard from workers who just who just uh, won an election. Um, don't have a contract at Starbucks. We have a newly formed unit at PAPS um, with their first contract. You guys have bargained a few contracts now. Um, I'm curious, uh, what does organizing look like for you all at Pfizer Forum? And and uh, yeah, how 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 do you talk to your your coworkers um, about why their union should be important to them? Okay, so uh, every Monday we have an orientation. Uh, for due district, typically I'm in charge of giving that. Uh, so we get like a 30 to 45 minute window where it's just the union and the new hires, where it's like a sit down. We, you know, kind of give them the rundown, uh, especially since I'm also a coworker of theirs. I kind of tell them some tips that I wish I had known uh, when I first got hired. But uh, in terms of organizing, I like to tell them that, hey, 
if you want things to improve here or if you want higher wages, you need to be a part of the union. Uh, otherwise, the company won't take you seriously when we come to bargain. They'll say, hey, you know, we only have 51% membership. Uh, we're going to treat you like you only have 51% membership as opposed to having, you know, 80 to 90% membership. Uh, and in terms of like my direct department, it's like 22 people, I believe. And I'm somewhat happy to say it's only two people that aren't in the union and my direct like coworkers. Uh, overall, I mean, past three V four orientations, we've had upwards from hundred percent union sign on to, I think the lowest we had was one person chose not to sign out of like that group. It was like nine people. So, I mean, people get the message that, Hey, if they want stuff to improve in the workplace, they have to be part of something bigger than them. And, uh, I'm also somewhat proud of the fact that, uh, some of our members well, not some a decent amount of our members, uh, they would argue with management when it came to like management saying, Hey, well, you know, uh, if the union weren't here, you'd be working more hours. Uh, cause the company would try to send them home after three. Uh, we had multiple union members come up to the management, like the boss's boss and say, Hey, no, uh, that's not true. The only reason we're here right now is because the union has this amount of time that we have to be here. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how things have been with Levy, but I'm sure they've been good too. Yeah, with 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 Levy, uh, I do the videos as well, the new employee orientations, and sometimes the classes from thirty to fifteen people. But our rate of membership is high nineties. Uh, we have over four hundred some odd employees in Levy, over in about the same amount in the Deer District. It's challenging at times because the I work with people and, and talk to people from 90 years old to 18. So there's a wide uh array of how they how they live, how they've been raised, how they think about stuff and what they care about. Uh so it's it's challenging at times. And then the jobs in which we do is seasonal, it's uh part-time work, it's not a full 40 hour job, like people are coming in from different jobs just to make ends meet, to have to work for two or three jobs to even pay bills. So it's it's challenging in the turnover per year. So it's like you starting over almost every season and you're giving them this information, you're giving them this information, but things are going great. Uh, I, I, I couldn't be more satisfied and gratified than, than, than what I'm doing because before I even worked at the Pfizer Forum, I'm I'm a cook. This being a part of a union and organizing was never a part of what I did. So it's 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 really uh gratifying that I can do this now and help people. So that's pretty much where it is with organizing with me. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing. Um that Troy, that was uh, actually very powerful uh to hear because now you are doing union, um, in fact. Um, because doing union means um, working together with your coworkers to make sure that the job is okay and that you have dignity on it while you're there and dignity off uh, when you're at home. So I really appreciate you sharing that uh, with us. Um, I am curious about um, to hear from Jack and Abby about um, your organizing efforts and whether you've been able to uh, de detect um, how those efforts have actually changed the way you all um, think about your relationship um, to your job, but also uh, to that of your boss. So I'm sure you've seen um, a very common meme, uh, which suggests um, that the boss uh, wants us to be a big, happy family. And so we act as a family. Um, and all that that entails. And so I'm curious in talking together and working together and fighting together, uh, what have you learned about yourselves um, and what is this process still teaching you? That the fact of my coworkers being my family, I don't think it's an act at all. Like I genuinely believe that even since like, especially since we started organizing that our store has felt more like a family because we are there for one another and we hear each other out. And I think that is the best scenario I could ask for, especially not even organizing, but just working in a space like that makes it so comforting. 
Um, but I think overall with the union and Starbucks and how Starbucks has acted towards unions and like even just trying to bargain for a contract, it's kind of made me sick, especially because Starbucks is such a billion dollar industry and coffee in general, but seeing the way that they treat their employees when they're simply trying to stand up for themselves and I'm trying to stand up for all of my other coworkers and seeing Starbucks just ignore it, essentially, it's kind of heartbreaking. So it's definitely a hard thing to keep my head held high, but I fully believe that the union is here for a reason and capital has been unionized for over two years and we just started and that's also building a relationship with them. So I'm excited to just learn more and more while Bart. And capital is the Starbucks out by the capital. That's what you mean when you say capital. Yes. Just, yes, just for other folks. <laughs> I also would agree with a lot of that um, that Jack said. When we first started organizing our first meeting, um, someone from the Capitol Square store said to us that we're about to find out what kind of company we really work for. And that was something that really has stuck with me this entire time because I, I mean, like I, when I started at Starbucks, it was fun. I loved being a barista. Like, oh my goodness, I work at Starbucks. It's it was so fun. Um, and I I understood that to some extent it's a corporation. Like it's not gonna be great um in a lot of terms, but wow, yeah, I really was shocked the things that I have learned about the company itself since starting this, like Jack said. It just truly makes me sick. Um, and so on that end of our, you know, our relationship with our boss, with the, the corporate side of things has definitely um, decreased um, in a, you know, positive way. It's definitely not, not on that side, but within the store itself, like Jack said, with each other, like we all have gotten so much closer and with our, like if we're saying boss is the corporation no not great boss is in our like store manager we had for the majority of the time we were in this fight like um he was wonderful and had so much to help us with and even now is still helping us so there are relationships that have gotten incredible uh or so much better um personally with people, which has been a really cool thing. But yeah, ultimately the relationship with Starbucks itself has become really, really not great. I want to just tip a little, I know we're going to gonna be closing out the question time. And so I want to tip quickly, um, you know, we live in a context where there's a lot more um, obvious union organizing and, and more job actions going on The um, Teamsters victory around their contract, the current writers strike in Hollywood. Um, we can see a lot of union stuff and we know there's a lot of support for unions, a uh, higher level of support for unions um, in popular opinion than we've had since 1965. So I wonder if any of you all see um, some impact of that context in your own struggles at work, in your own work in organizing. Does that kind of context change things for you, make it easier, give give people references, or do you feel like, nah, this is basically relationships and inside the work site? I'd love to start that with um, uh, Marlon and Ethan, and then also turn to Thomas and Troy for starters on that one. Sí, sí, ahí sí. Tiempo por eso es que nosotros no no hablamos de de eso, pero de este. Hablamos de otras cositas. Sí. So, and for them as workers, that doesn't really get to their conversation um, yes. amongst workers um, in terms of like labor rights or the pickets, everything that's happening um, with um, SGA, not SGA, um, with the SAG after uh, their strike. It really doesn't get to the world. They have time to talk about other stuff, but 
it's not really something that they're relatively very aware of. And, and Thomas and Troy, does the context, do you think, you know, like the popularity of unions or openness or these other actions going on really play out in your work site or uh, are you people, sort of more narrow too? People talk about it, but I'll bring that like the SAG strike in orientation saying, hey, you know, uh, if millionaires and like actors are allowed to have unions, you should be allowed to have one too. Uh, it also kind of helps, I guess, destigmatize unions. When like you see like your favorite actors being a part of a union or actively being a part of a picket line, you know, if they did grow up being more conservative, they might start to think, well, hey, well, you know, if this guy that I've liked my entire life is doing it, you know, it can't be all that bad. Uh, in terms of like going back a couple months ago, like the trucker strike, I know people on like my classification, they talked about that because uh, there are a couple conservative people that I work with and, you know, the stereotypical truckers conservative. So I would kind of bring it up saying, hey, well, you know, even they're in a union, what does that say about you? Uh, I don't know, we, we've we noticed it, I'd say. I don't know about it. Yeah, and I've uh, actually been a part of, well, MASH goes out and we went and did the marches and rallies and actions with UPS workers uh, a couple of months ago. We've uh, did some things with the Milwaukee County Transit uh, bus operators. Uh, it just goes a long way to not just be a part of MASH, but supporting other unions and things that are going around the city. So we've been involved in a lot of different things. And I really think everybody should be able to join a union. Uh, get a lot of stuff from Lynn Scott Walker, <laughs> dismantling a whole lot of stuff. And those are just things that we come across in these actions, but for the most part, I want to say that I'm more concerned with the people that I work with, and but it's a whole city thing. Yeah. So, um, Jason and Marlon, because we know you're going to uh, leave us shortly, I do want to ask you, um, given the state of your fight right now, what you all have been able to accomplish, um, and definitely in terms of uh, uh, winning against wage theft, what are your what does winning look like in the next six months or the next year or the next five years? Do you all see yourselves engaging in this fight um, in into the future? Um, and if so, uh, what what do you hope to accomplish? Hablar con mi compañero, mantenerlo unido en unión, pues, y también. ¿Cómo se ve la ¿Ah? ¿Cómo se ve estar en unión? Sí, eh, se ve bien. No, pero, o sea, ¿cómo se ve? En, viéndolo como sí. acta, uh, que sería sí. un ejemplo de estar en unión. Estar en comunicación, ayudándonos uno con otro. O sea, donde tenemos necesidad, pero como ahí teníamos necesidad todo, entonces. Nos pusimos de acuerdo en todo, en platicar y buscar ayuda también. Ayuda. Buscar información. ¿no? Ayuda con. No fue cuando contactamos a, a usted, ¿no? Aquí en la. Buscar asesoramiento, sí. es como este, con el web, como que este, eh, eh, nos ayuden sí. para un caso que tengamos. Nosotros no sabíamos bien cuáles eran nuestros derechos. Como estamos, somos nuevos de este país, no sé cómo, cómo actuar, sí, cómo actuar eh, cuáles eran nuestros derechos, nuestros deberes. También como nosotros nos sentimos también un poco más eh, tranquilos porque como nosotros estamos legales en este país. Eh, si no estuviéramos legales, no, no hubiéramos hecho el impulso. Por eh, miedo. Sí, por miedo. Entonces, eh, eso nos ayudó un poco también. Y también la unión que tuvimos todos en conjunto. Y también presionar, también presionar al, al del dólar que nos debía. Eh, ir al sitio también, ir a la oficina de, de la empresa que contactó a él. Bueno, fue el que contrató a su contratista. Y entonces, eh, nosotros nos sentimos pues bien organizado y 
tranquilo, pueda defender un derecho. So, in essence, um, for one, for sure, being able to have continued conversations with their coworkers about what issues are, sharing resources. So, either letting them know that when there are cases like wage theft, which are very common in the construction industry, especially the lower on the subcontracting rung that you fall, um, that resources like us, like Worker Justice Wisconsin, um, can is there to help them. Um, that their documentation status isn't an issue, um, whether they are documented or not, that all of these laws are also applicable to them. And then being to share that re resources, the information of those rights with their coworkers, um, goals at any current or future job sites. Um, so yeah, reassuring one another of those rights. And then um, using the exam, following a very similar method to when they recovered their wages from Stevens, um, making sure to put the pressure on higher ups to respond in situations that involve them, whether indirectly or actually directly, um, like with their wage kept, like with their wage theft case, the way that they did it with Stevens going straight to them to recover wages. Um, so more than anything, keeping informed and making sure that one another actually knows of their rights and any resources um, as they come up. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, you both are an example of the power that exists when workers stand together. So we really appreciate you um, sharing uh, your free time uh, with us before you go back uh, on the job. Uh, winning back or recovering $22,000 of stolen wages is no big, is, is a huge, huge deal. And I think um, you're, you're incredibly inspiring. So we really uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you. Um, Going uh, back to Troy and Thomas, I'll ask you the same question. What does winning look like, you know, tomorrow, six months from now, one year, five years? Troy, you mentioned that um, working and, and crafting solidarity, not only with your coworkers, but also across uh, work sites with workers that might not be in your local is also really, really important. So developing those relationships you, you touched on some uh, legal um, questions as well. I'm curious what for you all um, at Pfizer Forum, yeah, what is what does winning look like to you? It's a really long-term fight. Uh, you know, the second you think you've won, it's really the second you lost. I mean, you got to keep fighting. The second you get complacent, that's what they want. They want you to get complacent. So then you think, okay, I have everything I have, or I have everything I need. I don't need any more. Uh, they'll, I guess, I don't really know how to describe it, but like, you can't stop fighting for what you deserve. The second you stop fighting for what you feel like you deserve, you've lost, I guess is really what it comes down to, in my opinion. I don't know. And, and for me, we've just... Uh bargain our second contract uh you never get everything that you ask for or you want and it's give and take with some things winning for me uh just just to continue to fight uh everybody should be able to have living wage jobs it'll it'll cut down on a lot of stuff it goes hand in hand with the communities being able to thrive everybody should have a living wage job and be treated fairly. So that's what winning looks like to me. I mean, if people had great jobs, crime would go down. It, it would do a whole lot of different things for our city. Uh, and these jobs that aren't at the Pfizer form were, were given to low impoverished neighborhood people, uh, Biden's uh, citizens first. So that's what it looks like to me. And I got the book, so I'll, I'll be doing this as long as I can. Yeah. Just like if you had told people how different the work site would have been like five years ago, back when people were still working at the Bradley Center compared to how it is now, I think they wouldn't believe you. Like I know some people have seen their wages double. Some have even seen them triple. So, you know, especially in like Levy, I know there's at least a couple of departments where they've just straight up tripled how much they make. So, I mean, yeah, it's been a good five years for some. Yeah. And it's it's still not enough. The books are, they just sold for almost 
they like the second highest market in yeah. the in the NBA. They sure. almost worth four billion dollars, so they can give us more than the scraps that are falling off the table. So they want us to be complacent. We won't be complacent. So I guess that's our take on it. That's uh, great. Uh, great to hear, and great to hear both the kind of focus inside the work site and then what it means for the whole community. Um, um, I would love to hear from Abby and Jack both about what winning looks like. And I know, you know, um, Abby, you're maybe moving on, but thinking about how this opportunity has changed you and your own vision for for what winning looks like in the short term and the long term. And also Jack, so both of you to hear this a little bit um, from your perspective, what does winning look like? For Starbucks, we, all are with Starbucks Workers United. So we have one consolidated contract that we're fighting for across the board with all of the stores. So winning in the long term would look like Starbucks actually bargaining with us um, and not walking out of the bargaining room um, from things of that sort. Um, in the short term, at our store, I think winning looks like getting everybody on board, keeping everybody informed and on the same page and excited about this. Um, we have a really unique like group of people that we're working with because a majority of our staff at that store are college students. Um, so some of them are really well-versed in what a union is and what that means. Some of them have no idea and heard the word for the first time when I said it to them. So um, winning in the short term, it's just making sure everybody there knows that what we're doing is for us and what we're doing is going to help us and um, keeping everybody on board. I'm excited about that. And I, I think we're, we're doing a pretty good job of winning in the short term as far as that goes. So it's been just kind of like a waiting game with Starbucks to have that ultimate win and then continue to win from there. Thanks, that's great. And Jack, do you wanna throw in on that? I'll really say the same thing is that winning in the short term is exactly what we're doing now, which is continuing to organize within our store and keeping the conversation alive. Um, I think that it might not be another year until we even like begin to bargain and actually be able to sit down and write a contract but we are definitely on the right track and the starbucks workers united um, proposals are exactly what i personally want and from the stories that i've heard from other like organizers within starbucks it's all what really what everybody wants it's it's those better wages the zero tolerance of harassment for our health and safety it's just a lot of different things that I think they're like a lot of different things that we're going to win, but it just might be a long time coming. All right. Um, that's great to hear. And um, I, I want to flag one thing before we are going to kind of open it up for questions that Adrian will leave, but um, for anybody who is um, every single one of the workers on the panel today, the ones that had to leave early and the ones that are still here um, are willing to talk to the press about, um, about, their own work and their perspectives. And so if you need to be in touch with anyone, you can be directly in touch with Adrian or myself and we will get you their information. I just wanted to share that out and now turn it over to Adrian for the um, for closing out with questions. Wonderful, thanks so much, Laura. And thanks um, to all of our panelists. So now we're going to open up questions to you, the audience. You can ask questions in one of two ways. You can either type your question into the chat and I'll read it out for you to our panelists or you're welcome to ask the question yourself. In order to do that, I need you to navigate to the bottom of your screen and click on raise hand. And then I will uh, call on you, ask you to unmute, and then also ask you to turn on your camera so our panelists can see you so you can ask that question yourself. So the floor is open. And um, if we do not have any questions, then uh, we'll of course uh, close things out here. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you spending your time with us. So. Uh, the floor is open. Does anybody have any questions about uh, the work these worker leaders have been doing um, at their jobs? So I have a question for Thomas and Troy. Um, I think that's 
it's just us left anyway. Um, <laughs> but I was wondering, do you guys feel a sense of community from the city of Milwaukee? Because Abby and I, I'm grateful to have Madison as my town that I'm organizing in, but how has Milwaukee received it? Or do they really know about it? Because I know you guys said there's talk about it. Well, before the Pfizer form was built, we went into a community benefits agreement Match was a part of, which had them making it a union job and $15 an hour by 2000. And by the last Democratic National Convention, that was supposed to, but we're, we're at City Hall all the time and zoning meetings and doing a lot of things. So we're, we're really in the community and, and, and trying to make the whole city as a whole living wage jobs. And we do stuff with, hospitals and the county, the city, just all type of things like that. So yeah, the city is, is I was reading these in this Gallup poll thing with the 71% of Americans that are in support of the unions. And it's like only one in 12 people that actually live in Wisconsin are a part of it. I was ast astonished by that. Uh, I guess, cause I'm always around people that are into this or in, in, so I'm just really astonished by that. But yeah, the city backs us and we're trying to do some other things as things are going up, uh, being built to have them be union jobs. That was a really great question, Jack. Thank you so much. Um, supporting community support it, uh, can be a key element to any sort of worker struggle, um, whether it's for recognition, for a good contract, or um, for wage recovery, right? Um, I have received a, a question from Parwat who asks, um, and this may be difficult for some of you to answer because I don't know uh, the extent to which you engage with this and it's too bad Daniela has had to drop off the call. But Parwat asks, in organizing and unionizing, how has the process been to include workers who may speak different languages than um, some of their coworkers or the organizers they work with. So have any of you had any experience working um, and organizing coworkers or with an organizer um, who might not speak English as their first language? At least with my classification, we have people that are bilingual. So whenever we do get somebody that English isn't their first language, we at least have somebody that can still like communicate with them and like, the bilingual people in my department are all in the union. So I kind of say, Hey, this is what you should tell them by the way. Uh, so on and so forth. And they do eventually come around. Uh, we're pretty, I mean, a diverse group I'd say. Uh, but yeah, we don't really have too many bilingual people, but, or I guess people that don't speak English as the first language, but you know, we still have some people that can at least communicate with them. So, I mean, that helps the, organization process, I think. But yeah, I don't know about Levy or anything, but. You know, I haven't been in any meetings or come across anything like that. They don't even. Or uh, I'm fairly certain like the company also has like a policy where like if they don't speak English and no one speaks like their, you know, primary language. Uh, I think they have like a special program where like, you know, they bring somebody in and talk to them, even though I haven't like seen that since like the most common language we come across that isn't English is obviously Spanish. And, you know, we do have people that, you know, can speak Spanish and English. So, you know, kind of, right. but, yeah. Um, Natalie Yar asks, are your coworkers having trouble finding affordable health care? Um, yet another expense that we've, um, uh, had to have seen grow and all seem to be omnipresent. Um, are you making demands about uh, the provision uh, of such care in your contracts? Is this for us again? Or? Uh, well, it, it, this is to everyone. I mean, you are, Troy and Thomas, I have to say, you are the ones with the contract. So true, true. You, you are in the hot seat this time. So in our contract with Levy, uh, you have to work 40 hours a week to be eligible for the the healthcare things that they have going on. Otherwise, like I said, it's part-time, it's seasonal. A lot of people that I know because of what they get paid and how they get paid and the family 
like that they have their their own state insurance. Uh, we tried to fight for for this in our contract for everybody to be eligible to get health care. So that's something that we be working for. Uh, like I said, we just got the contract. And we're working on the next one, and it's gonna come up for three years, but it don't hurt to start now. And that's something that we're uh, working toward. Okay, a, a quick follow up there. What about childcare? Um, do any of your colleagues have children at home that need care when their parents or their caregivers are at work? What, what? are you all doing in your workplaces to try and secure some support from your employer to provide that childcare, which enables people to work their jobs on a daily basis? As far as I'm aware, we don't have any real provisions in the contract that talk about childcare, but when something like that comes up and like if the company at the end of the day, you're a resource to them. Uh, if you don't show up for work because you had to take care of your child or anything like that, they'll write you up uh, because they don't mark it as an excused absence. Uh, but we've gotten multiple people off through like the grievance process, got them that, you know, write-ups taken back. So, I mean, now at least, this isn't really that big a problem in like security because the people that do have children in security more often either just work part-time and they're older people. So, you know, they, you know, their kids are grown or, uh, some full-time employees over there, there's only about like 15 to 20 positions for security that are actually full-time. Uh, they usually just work that out with the scheduler, like in person, but part-time workers, they don't really have much protection when it comes to that. But when they do get written up, they come to us and we take care of them. Yeah, I spent a whole lot of my summer with grievances and, and what's excused, what's not excused, uh, what the management and the corporation thought was uh, excused and wasn't, uh, and everybody should be, if they have children, I mean, they should be able to have childcare. Uh, unfortunate, a few people lost their jobs because of this, this issue where they just couldn't work because they didn't have anybody to watch their kids. So. We working on that as well within the next contract. Yeah. It's it's just some things, like I said, we won a lot of things and then a lot of things they just didn't accept. But I, I think those are very important and they should be in, in all jobs. Thank you for that. Um, Parwat asks another great question that I'll direct up uh, to you and Abby Jack, which is um I want you both to think back to when you started organizing at Starbucks. How did you create trust and mutual understanding between your coworkers and yourself? How did you actually go about building that? So you both have actually touched on the fact that you feel as though you have a, a family or like a, a very, like a, a fictive kinship uh, relationship with your coworkers. But how, how did you, how did you first start? How did you make the approach and how did you work to, um, build that connection uh, with your coworkers so they knew you were for real and you weren't uh, just jerking them around? Um, so in the beginning, when we started this whole process, we actually went through every single person at our store and did like a little trust assessment, gut assessment on how just based off of what we can assess from our knowledge, how they would um, agree, disagree, react to unionizing. Um, and after that, we broke down with all of our organizing team um, who was closer to these people or these people, and we split everybody up so that we had one person for every single other worker in the store to make sure that whoever they would be mutually comfortable talking to you about this like we covered that ground um so if there's someone who's really quiet but sometimes jokes around with this person about this or that they get that person so they can you know if they have that established relationship already it gets them an easier in to talk to them about it and i think a big part of like gaining a lot of their trust was 
when we first started and went public, um, we had like a lot of warning from other like stores and our like union rep who have already gone through all of this stuff on almost verbatim what corporate was going to come into our store and do. So we were able to say, okay, they're going to come in. This is exactly what they're going to say to you to try to convince you that this is wrong. Here's the facts of the matter. Here's the truths of this and what we can tell you and offer you. Um, they're going to tell you this. That's a lie. Here's why that's a lie. Here's the proof. And then it would happen just like that. They would send someone from corporate into our store. They would pull people out for one-on-ones say exactly what we told them they were going to hear from them so that right there is an automatic like oh they're telling me the truth that this is exactly what starbucks is going to say this is what they're going to do and that was exactly what happened so i i think honestly starbucks kind of helped us out with uh gaining their trust because in everything since we started on starbucks and they have done all of the bad things that we warned everybody about. So it just shows everybody right away. Like, oh, they're they're not lying to us. Like, this is true. This is what's going to happen. And they told us that a week ago. Awesome. I think that talking about the inoculation against the anti-union playbook that the boss runs with over and over again, it's a solid way uh, to demonstrate um, your, your, depend, uh, your dependability and your honesty for sure. Jack, I would love to hear uh, more from you, particularly about how um, you created and fostered uh, these relationships um, and how literally you started. Like, tell me, like, tell us about the first one-on-one you had or the first time you pulled aside a coworker to talk um, about um, how you'd make the workplace better. I think Abby's timeline at the beginning of this panel, um, she said we started organizing in March. I think it goes back a little bit further than that. In February of this year, I had um, an interview with um, a friend of a friend who is in the journalism school here at UW-Madison. And basically, she was like, I want to interview a non-unionized store versus a unionized store. So she talked to me from State Street because we weren't unionized at that time. And she talked to another store, um, the Capitol store up on the square here in Madison. And basically what I said to her was like, we don't have anyone to headline it. Otherwise we would definitely be unionized. And this was in the Madison Commons, um, I think community news source. I don't think it's a newspaper, but it's a website. I can link it here if everyone really wants. But I think that the word got out with that article and then everyone was kind of questioning it. They were like, what does a union mean? Like what, what would this entail and whatnot? And I think one of the first one-on-ones I had was with Abby as well as um, a few other shift supervisors. So kind of like leads in the store. Um, And I think we had a big conversation about like, we need to do this because it's going to do so much good for us. So I think all of us being on that same headspace definitely was the right track to go from because talking to everyone else has been such an easy thing to do because of our union rep and because of the Capitol Street store and having communication and community within everyone. So just talking to one another is so easy. And I'm so grateful for that. Thanks for that, Jack. Um, How did or are the organizers handling the possible fear of retaliation or firing when you guys talk about union? Um, what's the backup plan if the organizers working on unionizing are let go? So how do you, um, these are typical, uh, the boss the, or, and the employer preying on fear of retaliation, of uh, unions being bad and wrong, um, as a means to try and undercut your efforts, either Troy and Thomas, to expand the power and build strength in your workplace or Jack, even to get across the finish line and and score that election win, win to get the contract. I'm curious um, how you guys push back against um, those kinds of tactics from your employer. 
And Thomas and Troy, you did kind of touch on it a little bit when, when you said some of your coworkers do, in fact, um, call out misinformation from the boss when, when it's shared in meetings. But I'd love uh, to hear more about it. Well, I mean, I think management kind of knows based off the fact that, hey, at least DD, we have Deer District, by the way, uh, 75 to 80% of the people there in the union, uh, you'd have to get rid of a lot of people once they find out they're stewards or, uh, you know, union, other union members are getting fired simply for being in the union. Uh, it also kind of helps with the fact that, you know, we've been there a long time now. So the people that did want us gone, some of those managers aren't even there anymore. Uh, along with just like, we have like a union presence to the point where like, I've had some people say, hey, uh, you know, no, because, you know, Peter will often sometimes sit by the uh, table. So, oh, no, Peter today? Where is he? You know, like they expect us to be there. It's odd when we aren't there. So, you know, after an extended period of time of the union not being there, I'm sure people would notice. And as far as Levy's contract goes, we have a article and a provision in our contract where if they did try to fire or discipline you for being in a union or back in the union, then they'd be in trouble. So mm -hmm. all our stuff, our contract supersedes whatever they do and they, they handbook. So we actually have a great contract when it comes to that. So they don't have to fear or worry about things like that happening to them because we definitely fight it. Jack, in your experience, what have you guys been, um, have found at, at Starbucks on state ha has, uh, has corporate, uh, tried, um, some of these tactics on you and what has your um, rep and, and what have you all been doing to um, educate your coworkers about what their rights are and what's illegal for the boss to do? Around the same time that we started organizing, so like that February, March area, um, there was a story about a barista, a six-year barista in New York, and they were fired for like false claims and whatnot, but it was purely because they voted yes to the union. I think hearing about that story and how that partner was fired and now they have to be reinstated and back paid like $21,000 because they were falsely fired. I think hearing that story is what keeps me going and what helped me at the beginning of this because I was like, the union will fight. That's what the union is there for. Starbucks Workers United and Workers United as um, as a labor union, they help employees with that, and that's things that, and that's proof in the pudding, you know. So I think having that story and a few more stories that are coming out right now, and I think like just having those lawsuits to back up that they were falsely fired and now they have to be paid this money back, I think it's just proof that the union works. And it's headstrong, and I try not to get too cocky about it because I don't want to be fired. And I'm not trying to be fired by any means, but I think that it's just a good idea to have in case like something does go wrong. I think that's a perfect place to end it. There is power in a union, whether it's a formal one or an informal one. Uh, you can take that one to the bank. I'd like to thank everyone here on this call, including the audience. This includes... Laura Dresser, Jack Savin, Abigail Marcus, Troy Brewer, Thomas Wynn, Haley Humphrey, Marlon, and Jason Palacios, and Daniela Campo, who did uh, the translation. Uh, you all were really great. We really appreciate the work that you're doing um, as leaders, as workers in your uh, workplace. Uh, we want to hear more uh, uh, about how that goes. So please stay in touch. Um, thank you so much. We'll take care.